Start then with South Asia and Southeast Asia again. So we are getting into it. So 600 BCE to 600 CE, classical era in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Now, just to kind of get our bearings here, what are a couple of modern countries in South Asia? India, India, India China. South Asia. China. Well, what's like just northwest of India? Pakistan. Pakistan. Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Nepal. Now in Southeast Asia, this is where you've got like Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand. So, now during this time period then, there's a few big things that are happening. Number one, the Indian Ocean Trade Network begins during this time, where you start to see the flow of trade and goods around the Indian Ocean. And one thing to remember is that as trade grows, cities grow to facilitate trade as through points. So all around the Indian Ocean, you start to see ports pop up that become centers for trade, where you have diverse peoples from all over the Indian Ocean coming in and trading goods, and, and, um, and stuff will change hands. Now, knowledge of the monsoon winds that moved back and forth across the Indian Ocean at different times of the year this was going to be crucial for being able to do trade on the Indian Ocean. And this made it easier for merchants to go east and north in the, in the Indian Ocean um, during the summertime, and during, during the winter, they'd go the other directions. So, now, in South Asia in particular, though, so during this time period, one of the big things that emerges, of course, are a couple of major religions. Now, in India, prior to this, um, the religion that was done in India was kind of a big like jumble of polytheistic traditions and rituals that became known as Vedic religion because the very first scriptures within this religious tradition were called the Vedas in the language of Sanskrit. Now, eventually though, Vedic religion uh, turned into Hinduism. That was the word that was eventually applied to this uh, sort of broad group of religious traditions. And this is where you have, you know, the belief in multiple gods that represent different forces in the universe. But there is like the one sort of unity behind all of existence called Brahman, where the universe has a sort of stuff that it's made of, and everything, even the gods, are just like one piece of that sort of universal stuff. So there is kind of a connection among all beings in the world. And they believe in a reincarnation, and um, that you had dharma to fulfill, um, or spiritual obligations while you were alive. But Buddhism, though, also emerged in South Asia during this time. And Buddhism is predicated on the idea that, yes, whatever you are gets reincarnated, but... Um, but there are sort of truths about existence, the Four Noble Truths, to be exact. And according to the Buddha, who lived in about the 500s BCE, the truth about existence is that no matter what class you're from or background you're from, you will suffer at some point in your life. Suffering will occur, and it's because you are attached to things in the world. You have desire for things in the world um, that kind of keep you stuck and that you can never really be satisfied with what you have. And even if you think you're happy, even if you think that you have tons of like love and enjoyment in the world, your loved ones will die, your friends will move on, 
you will have suffering. So the Buddha taught that the way to remove yourself from that suffering was to understand that the things you were attached to were just as, like, you know, temporary as your existence. And that if you break those attachments, you will become enlightened, and you will no longer be reborn into the world. You won't be sort of, like, trapped in the world anymore. Now, Hinduism, though, became the basis for the caste system, like the rigid social class hierarchy, where your position in society was based on your spiritual quality in a Hindu concept, where you know you were born into a particular group based on whatever you know you had done for your dharma in previous lives. <clears throat> so in the caste system then there wasn't really any social mobility and it was a system where some groups were more privileged than others because of their you know spiritual quality from previous lives. Buddhism really kind of denied the caste system and said that it didn't matter what caste or what class you were from, follow the way of the Buddha and you will achieve enlightenment by meditating and sort of understanding like that life is you know temporary and impermanent and so on. So Buddhism also very quickly developed into a monastic tradition where monks and nuns would go to live in monasteries so they could devote themselves entirely to their religious pursuits and kind of remove themselves from mainstream society. Yes? Which one was it that was monastic, Theravada, or...? Uh... Well, in both types of Buddhism, there are monasteries. Theravada was more sort of strictly monastic, where... I'm turning this off, by the way. Just so it doesn't, like, make a lot of noise. So, both types of Buddhism were monastic, but... Theravada was the sort of like original version that was more strict. Like you really sort of had to be a monk to really devote yourself properly. But Mahayana, the type that became more popular in Central Asia and East Asia, rather than South and Southeast Asia, that kind of syncretized with existing you know, Chinese religion and Taoism and incorporated ideas about, like, gods, and that the Buddha was a god who you could pray to for assistance on your path, and that you could, like, apply Buddhist principles to your life, even if you weren't living in a monastery. So it became more, like, of a popular sort of everyday religion as it passed into the Silk Road and East Asia. But Theravada, though, became bigger in South Asia and Southeast Asia, and that was much more sort of strict where, you know, you would support your local monastery, but if you weren't in the monastery, then you weren't going to become enlightened. Yes? T-H-E-R-A-V-A-D-A. -A -A. It's going to be up on the board in a second. So. Um, also, then, let's see. Now, in South Asia, though, during the classical era, there were two major empires that existed. The Maurya Empire and the Gupta Empire. The Maurya was earlier, the Gupta was later on, and basically both of these empires, you know, they did things the way that empires do things. They had a powerful military, they had a centralized government with a bureaucratic system, they promoted trade and public works and infrastructure, they, you know, allowed some tolerance for like local cultures and traditions um, in order to like maintain just order and stability. They did things that empires do. There's a couple of uh, specific things to be aware of here, though. In the Maurya Empire, this guy here, Ashoka the Great, was the one single Indian ruler, really ever, who seriously promoted Buddhism as the religion of India. He didn't force people to adopt it, but he encouraged people to and through his like law system, he kind of encouraged people to behave in a properly Buddhist way and have compassion and nonviolence and so on. But generally speaking, though, Indian rulers will, will usually advocate Hinduism instead because Buddhism was looked at with some suspicion as you know, something that kind of challenged the traditional hierarchy of society. Now, within the caste system then, so during the Gupta Empire later on, in like the two, three, four hundreds CE, that's really when the caste system becomes very sort of 
I guess you could say stable and crystallized, where it's very clear by that point in the evidence that the caste system is there, and people take it very seriously as the basis for their lives. Now, in that regard then, one of the sort of interesting things about India is that, generally speaking, caste membership will be more important for people's sort of identity than political um, states. So no matter who the king is or whatever empire is in place, people will generally feel more governed by the expectations for their caste as like the law that they live by rather than you know political systems and what and what the ruler or the emperor says. So it's kind of a unique um, system that develops there. So now also the Gupta Empire, they're the ones who invent the concept of zero for the first time in Afro-Eurasia. So the numeral system that we use comes from the Gupta Empire. So thank you, Guptas. Thank now, you. everyone say thank you, Guptas. Thank, thank you, Guptas. Guptas. All right. So, so in Southeast Asia, then, down here, there's a few things going on. So civilization there starts to develop a little bit later on after Indian civilization. And as Southeast Asia um, develops, you're going to see that there will be very deep trade connections between South Asia and Southeast Asia. I mean, it's natural, it's like right there. So there will be some Hindu influence, not because like Hindu, Hinduism doesn't really have missionaries, but Hindu merchants who go from India to Southeast Asia will bring some of their ideas with them. And you start to see some Hindu influence in this region. But eventually, though, Theravada Buddhism makes its way into Southeast Asia as well. So in places like Thailand, um, that's where you have very deep Theravada Buddhist roots being laid down. So um, anything else about this before we move on? Yes? Theravada is the one who is strictly uh, monastery? Yeah, where it's, it's more like there's more sort of demanding expectations of you in order to achieve enlightenment, I suppose. And, I, and that's probably something that if a Mahayana Buddhist heard me say it, would probably be offended, so I should probably take that back. They say what? That like Theravada is more demanding in order to achieve enlightenment. But, uh, okay. So now, moving along. So 600 to 1450, the post-classical era. So, I actually took two different maps here and like stitched them together. So cool, right? So one big thing that ha thing that happens here then during this time period, the intensification of rice cultivation. So better irrigation technology is invented, and um, bigger kingdoms and empires develop that can organize labor to maintain irrigation and maintain um, the production of food. So along the major river systems of South and Southeast Asia, rice becomes the primary staple crop. So the Indus River, the Ganges River in South Asia, and you can't see it here, but there's a river called the Mekong. You don't really need to know that, I guess, but the Mekong River in, in Vietnam. So rice cultivation becomes enormous here, which means population will grow. And this becomes one of the most densely populated areas in the whole world pretty quickly. So. Um, now, Indian Ocean trade also intensifies during this time. And this is going to lead to, very clearly, diasporic merchant communities being sort of strewn around the Indian Ocean. So, there will be Indian merchants living in, um, you know, down in Southeast Asia, and Vietnamese merchants in India, and all of this kind of far-flung, you know, networking going on where people will set up communities for like their people in the cities where they're doing business. Yes? Is it basically like how in the document will explain like, like you have Egyptian people and people from mm -hmm. the Arabian Peninsula? Exactly. Exactly. And also, during this time period, another religion emerges into the Indian Ocean. So Islam is going to spread in coastal areas around the Indian Ocean. So, the interior of India like right in the middle, will be very, very solidly Hindu. But around the coastal areas, where there's a lot of interaction and trade going on, that's where Islam starts to have some influence. And the same thing in Southeast Asia. So inland, 
peasants living in Vietnam or in the Khmer Empire here will remain Buddhist um, at this point, but down along the coastlines where there's more sort of trade going on, there's more Islam. So there is going to be kind of a like a disconnect culturally between different sections of these regions, depending on like you know how connected they are to trade. And also, you start to see new elites emerging. So in Indian society and in, in the societies of Southeast Asia, these are two places where merchants, people who are engaging in commerce and trade and making money and moving goods, become very powerful social classes pretty early on. And even though in India, you know, merchants are like the third rank in the social caste system, the reality is they become fantastically powerful and wealthy, and society becomes very commercialized where people will start producing goods to sell to merchants or to you know, export for trade rather than just for their own like personal subsistence use. And once again, cities just grow all over the coastal areas of um, Southeast Asia and South Asia. Now, one architectural thing I would like to draw your attention to, though. The Khmer Empire, which controlled what's now Cambodia um, and parts of Thailand, they produced the largest Buddhist temples, temple complex in history at a place called Angkor Wat, which you can see pictured right here. It was the <coughs> biggest, it started as a Hindu temple, but then was converted into a Buddhist temple complex. The biggest Buddhist temple complex in the world was in Angkor, right there. So, kind of cool. Now, so during this time period in South Asia, so you can see it's kind of disjointed. And once again, there were some trading cities along the coast that were like independent, and people had more sort of caste loyalty than like political loyalty. So there are, you know, there's just this jumble of like small Hindu kingdoms all over India. And some of them have sort of a feudal system, but others are more based around like trade and become more centralized. You don't really need to know that much about like different kingdoms or empires during this time in India. Now, in the north though, Islam enters into India in another way, where Turkic peoples who had settled in Central Asia and became Muslim now invade northern India. And you have sultanates, like the Delhi Sultanate, um, developing in northern India where you have Muslim Turkic rulers ruling over a Hindu majority population. But other than the fact that now like some people are becoming Muslim, not really that much like changes about life in India for most Hindu people. So, now, what does start to happen though is that as trade increases and grows, there will be a great deal of commercialization pretty early on. So you start to see a lot of peasants in India, rather than just producing food for themselves, will start producing cash crops um, of spices and cotton to sell to merchants that they know is going to be used elsewhere um, instead. So this idea of commercialization means when people are producing things to sell for cash, for money, rather than just for their own personal use. And that's kind of like one of the bases for like market economies and capitalism later on. In Southeast Asia, then, um, once again, there's Islam in sort of coastal trading cities and areas. And you've got a, a number of small kingdoms that develop that are all sort of competing for control of different sectors of trade and farmland. Um, and in particular, the Strait of Malacca right there becomes one of the like this is like some of the most valuable real estate in the whole world. Because if you control access in and out of that strait, that means you can tax it, you can control the flow of trade between India and China. So that's kind of a super important spot right there. So, um, yes? What's the difference between a sultan and a caliph? The word sultan is like the Turkic word for ruler or king. And for the most part, people who were sultans never claimed to be caliphs. 
So like the Sultan who ruled in Delhi, the, a city in northern India, mm -hmm. he never would have said, I am the Caliph. He was just the guy who ruled northern India. And he never claimed any like sort of religious leadership beyond that. So the fact that they were Muslim was kind of like incidental to the fact that they were political rulers. And they never sort of claimed, you know, divine right the way that caliphs did. So, um, all right. So moving along. Oh yeah, spices. Lots and lots and lots and lots of spices in Southeast Asia. That intensifies during this time. Intensification of spices. Um, so, shall we continue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, um, 1450 to 1750, around this part of the world. So now, <coughs> Europeans arrive, and they shake things up a little bit. So the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, and others start creating trading post empires, where they take over um, cities around the Indian Ocean, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, and And it becomes a much more sort of competitive and sort of violent system of trade. Because to some extent, these Europeans are just kind of like pirates, just trying to grab whatever resources and ports they can, and then just taxing people for going in and out of those ports. Or you know, being the ones actually shipping the goods themselves, rather than um, allowing locals to do it. So, now, one of the biggest ways in which Europeans have a presence around the Indian Ocean, though, is through their trading companies. And in particular, the Dutch East India Company, which sets up uh, spice plantations in Indonesia, and the British East India Company, which starts doing business around India. So, oh man, I forgot to do the animation. So once again, though, this leads to the development of mercantilism, this kind of like violent competitive, competitiveness over access to trade and resources. And the Dutch especially are like ruthless when it comes to this. They will do things like, you know, force some native Indonesians to work on spice plantations. And if they hear about like people on an island they don't control who are raising the same spices, they might go in and like burn the place down just to like send a message. They're ruthless when it comes to protecting their control of the spice trade coming out of Southeast Asia. So, but increasingly though, you see more commercialization and increasing volume of trade. So, in India and in China, if you are an Indian farmer who is producing some cotton or some tea or something, and British merchants start showing up in greater and greater numbers trying to buy your tea from you, you're going to see your prospects actually improve. So, to some extent, this is an era of huge economic growth in Europe, but also in places that are producing all of this stuff in Asia. So, now in South Asia then, this is when the Mughal Empire begins to expand across India. Yes? I thought there was only one city that they were allowed to build in China. Wow. So, Canton is the port that the Qing Dynasty allowed Europeans to trade at. Macau, though, was a Portuguese colony that they had conquered earlier. So Macau was basically that's where like Portuguese merchants would go, and then from there they would go up to Canton, do business with Chinese merchants, then come back to Macau. That's like where they had their sort of home base. So the Mughal Empire then was another group of Turkic uh, Muslims who invaded northern India and became quite powerful. And once again, they did all the things that empires do. They had powerful military technology. In this case, it was like gunpowder-based weapons. And they you know, made alliances with like local elites to help them rule over um, the country. So they did the things empires did. They claimed that they were ruling um, you know, in order to like bring Islam, like the true religion, to the people. But generally, though, the Mughals were pretty tolerant, as big, diverse empires had to be. And they generally allowed Hindus to you know, have the same rights they always had and do their religion and so on. So they were pretty tolerant. 
Now, go ahead. Um, but also, though, a new syncretic religion also developed in northern India under the Mughals called Sikhism. So this is a religion that began in the Punjab, the very far north of India. And there, the leaders of this religion, they combined monotheism from the Islam with reincarnation from Hinduism. And, the, and basically they also you know, had the idea of spiritual equality from the Islam. So it was kind of, you know, a syncretism. It was a mashup of different religious ideas pulled from different places. And they also kind of had the I same idea as Zoroastrianism, that as long as you are good, it didn't really matter what religion you were actually part of. That being good was good, and being bad was bad. And they, and they would claim to defend the rights of all people, no matter what religion they were, as long as you, as long as you were good. So, a very sort of tolerant um, religious tradition. Now, in Southeast Asia, a couple of things going on there. This is one of the spots in Asia where Europeans do have some success at really conquering big chunks of territory. So the Dutch begin colonizing Indonesia, or the Dutch East Indies, and they set up sugar plantations, that, or excuse me, spice plantations, that become immensely profitable for the Netherlands. And in the Philippines, this set of islands, the Spanish colonized the Philippines, and they set up sugar plantations there, and they used Manila, um, the major city of the Philippines, as their sort of like home base in Asia, where they then will send ships to trade with China. And this is where like a big chunk of the silver from America actually flows through on its way to India or to China um, during this time period. So, shall we continue? Yes. All right, now, 1750 to the present. We're going to move pretty quick here. So, starting in the late 1700s and then through the 1800s, this is when Europeans really start to establish more control over parts of Asia. So, during this moment when like the British and other Europeans really have a lot of power because of their industrial technology and economic strength. So, in India then, the British gradually establish control over basically all of India. But once again, it's just like in any empire. In some cases, they make agreements with like local rulers to just kind of like leave them in power as long as they pay tribute and taxes and so on. And they're generally pretty tolerant towards the Indian people because it's only like, you know, a few thousand British people really ruling over uh, the country. So, now there is a rebellion though that becomes pretty violent in 1857, where Indian nationalists try to you know, violently um, overthrow the British. And in response, the British actually kind of take a double course. On one hand, they put down this rebellion pretty brutally. It's led by like Indian soldiers and peasants. But then after the fact, they start to make a little bit more of an effort to really kind of develop India and make it more prosperous and more sort of effective as a country. And the British look at India as the jewel of their empire, like the country that they have the most pride in as a colony. So they started building railroads, mostly just to like get you know goods from the interior out to um, the coast for trade. And you know they allow some industrialization to start happening. So some Indians are actually allowed to start building steel mills, for example. And um, India starts to become a little bit more prosperous again, but it's still under British control. And the British are sort of discriminatory toward people of low class and low caste in India. And they really kind of favor people from upper castes, guys like Gandhi, who actually began as a lawyer speaking English, um, trained in British schools. Now, during the new imperialism, then, this is when you have this kind of like quick takeover by industrial powers from Europe. So France takes over part of Southeast Asia called, well, they called it French Indochina, 
which contained Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. And these countries were ruled by the French as colonies until the 20th century. And once again, the Dutch, they expanded their control over Indonesia and, and really kind of centralized their authority there even more based on new technologies and communication and economic power that they had. So they're just kind of expanding their authority. Now, of course, though, once you get to the 20th century, this is when decolonization occurs. And just like other places where decolonization happened, it was really due to the efforts of nationalist leaders in these countries who had basically become sick and were critical of European rule because they had supported, like in India, they had supported the British in World Wars I and II, and they felt like they deserved freedom and independence um, as a result. So in South Asia, India and Pakistan became separate countries after independence because there was a sort of ongoing dispute between the Hindu majority in India and Muslim nationalists who wanted to have their own separate country where they could be the ones in charge and have self-determination. So, in 1947, India was given its independence and officially partitioned itself. So part of India became Pakistan and the rest remained India. But this led to pretty extreme violence and resentment because millions of people started to flow across the border there um, as you know refugees and displaced people trying to get to the country that they wanted to go to. There were episodes of like mob violence. And now, in the aftermath, India and Pakistan are still kind of like in their own little cold war in South Asia because they never really, really resolved the disputes over some territory um, along the border between the two countries. And of course, those are two of the countries that have nuclear weapons and they're not in the non-proliferation treaties, so, you know, they got, but they play cricket matches against each other to kind of let off some steam. So, in Vietnam and Cambodia, communist governments take over there and drive out the French um, in the 1950s, and they installed communist systems, like in China, with collectivized agriculture, command economies, and, you know, ultimately, they also kind of go the way of China by reforming those systems and allowing more capitalist type um, development in the 1980s and 90s, even though both of them are still ruled by communist parties. They still, you know, they're still ruled by the same government, but they've allowed some reforms kind of like the Chinese have. So, and the Philippines was actually taken over, um, yes, Bob. Um, why did the Vietnam War occur? So, Vietnam, basically the French, you know, unlike the British in India, where they allowed Indians to gradually like retake control over the country, in Vietnam there wasn't really any indication that the French were going to allow Vietnam to just become independent. So, if you are a you know devoted Vietnamese nationalist, what do you do when the people who are ruling over you? aren't going to leave. You start a war and try to drive them out from violence instead. So Ho Chi Minh, who was a communist and a nationalist at the same time, you know, they tried to drive out the French. And then, in order to try and stop like a communist takeover of the whole country, that's when the United States intervened and tried to block communist expansion across Vietnam. And then eventually we withdrew from the country when we basically decided it just wasn't worth the effort or the expense or the you know violence anymore. So now in the Philippines then, this actually became a US colony in 1898 after we went to war against Spain. And then in the 1940s, we granted the Philippines its independence. And that has since be, you know become an independent country as well. Now, one of the real big success stories, though, of decolonization has been Singapore, right down here. This is a city-state along the Strait of Malacca. And this had been a British colony for a few decades. But it was a very sort of diverse city. And even like since the post-classical era, 
What eventually became Singapore was home to <coughs> diasporic communities of Chinese people and some Arabs and Indians and Indonesians. So following their independence, their government actually made a very sort of concerted effort to A, make sure everyone learned English as their primary language. So children in Singapore were forced to learn English as their number one language, basically so they could like participate in global trade more effectively. And they really emphasized investing in education. And basically, they turned Singapore almost overnight into one of the most rapidly expanding economies in the world that is one of the most like sort of plugged into global trade and finance and so on. So it's like one of the wealthiest places on earth right now. So any questions about this? Yes. Is that the country, is that the country with the really strict laws? Yes. They have been accused of perhaps being like a little authoritarian, I guess. And there are a number of crimes for which corporal punishment is the um, is the punishment, like getting like hit with a bamboo cane or something. Or something. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there was a famous case in the '90s that I think I referenced in class of an American yeah. tourist. Who, oh yeah. He, was he did something. He like. He spit gum. <laughs> he might have. I don't know if it was spitting gum, but he might have like, you know, he he did something that was considered an act of like minor vandalism, and he was detained by the Singaporean government, and he was going to be caned as punishment. And in the United States, like, some people in the U.S. were freaking out, like, no, you can't do that, like, he's an American. You know, he didn't understand your laws, like, you can't blame him. So, but then, you know, he got caned and then sent home. And I'm assuming never allowed back in the country. Yes? It's kind of, like, off topic, but what does totalitarian mean? That is a government in which the people in power essentially are trying to have total control over like the government and culture and just lives of their people where like every aspect of of their people's lives is kind of controlled and planned and supervised by the government so like stalin in the soviet union would have been, been a good example of a totalitarian someone who wanted to have complete command control over the lives of his people. So, all right, um, now, Middle East, North Africa. Let's do this. And actually, I'm gonna take this opportunity to make sure this thing is still recording. Yes. Oh, and it's plugged into the Yes, so here's what I'm gonna do, actually.